Well, that was awesome. Wasn't that wonderful? Boy. (laughs) The Lord is certainly faithful to us. As we sit and marvel at what the Lord has done and as we have another installation service to remind ourselves of, of that very goodness of God. Isn't that great? That the Lord has continued to show his blessing for generation after generation and we are participants in what God is doing and that should be exciting for you. It should be exciting for us as a congregation as we see the Lord working in our midst and seeing what he's done that we would never forget what has happened in the life of this congregation. That we would be able to give testimony for years to come for generation after generation to hear of what the Lord did here a few months ago and what he's doing in our midst. And so we continue, though, looking at the book of James. It's going to remind us, too, what the Lord desires for us to look like as God's people. So if you have your book of, or your Bible with you, I'd love for you to turn to the book of James. I'm not going to jump in there yet. I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about the art world. I don't know if you've been following some of the stories that have been happening in in the world of art, uh, but many of the art pieces that have been sold on the market have been forgeries. Many of them have been fake replications of famous works, and it requires an expert now to even tell if what you purchase is something that is truly real, if it is the real thing, or if it's a forgery. Steve Martin, the comedian, was one of those who probably needed to have an expert with him when he decided to buy this very famous piece of work for millions of dollars, and he ended up finding out that he purchased a forgery. He was part of a, of a scheme or a scam that was happening by these German forgers who were forging German expressionists, and more than 30 of these people have been found now, and they've made over $50 million by selling fake goods. And Steve Martin became a victim. He became one of those that needed to have somebody tell him what the real thing looked like because obviously to his untrained eye, it was not possible for him to know. So he was scammed. And so it's really hard to find the real thing in the art market and even today what people say, probably 50% or more of the art that's for sale are forgeries. And even the art galleries around the world are starting to find that many of their pieces that have been hanging on the wall are truly not at all what they represent. And so that is a problem. James is going to teach us the same thing about faith this morning. He's going to tell you what fake faith looks like, and he's going to also tell you what the real thing should look like. And that's what James has been doing throughout the whole book. He's been telling us about true religion, what it truly looks like, that you will take care of the widow and orphan, you'll be taking care of those in need, that it's not just the head knowledge that we have, but it is something that seeps down into our heart and then is expressed in our hands and feet. And when we do not see that, then we realize that we're in the midst of a forgery. We're in the midst of fake faith. So James is going to again tell us what it looks like. So if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 2, verse 14, and hear the word of God for us this morning. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has a faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? Well, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder at that fact. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scriptures were fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. 
You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So let's pray as we hear the word of the Lord speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning longing to hear you speak to our hearts. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would move in our midst. For you are the expert on what true faith really is. And Father, we pray that you would open our eyes to see to see what it looks like to be a follower that you designed, to live according to your ways, to have saving faith, and that we would be a church that would express that in the way that we go about our lives, in our workplace, in our places of recreation, wherever we live and work and play, that Christ would be evident in our lives, that it would be seen and visible, that we would be salt and light in your world as you've called us to be. So we pray now that the power of your Holy Spirit would be unleashed upon us to give us a greater understanding to do that work of convicting us and training us for righteousness for the very work that you called us to be. And we ask that you would do that work even in our midst this morning, renewing our hearts to have a greater love and appreciation for you and your grace and your mercy that has followed us all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. James has made it very clear what true religion looks like. It's going to be fruitful. It's going to have something that's evident in your life. Even Jesus said this, you will know my disciples by their love for one another. He wanted to tell you that you are going to be on display and and the way that you interact with people will determine for them if you're a true follower of Jesus Christ. There will be evidence of your love for God. So this is why James starts off. He said, look, here's an example. If this is what it looks like, I want you to know what a true religion is, what true faith is. If anyone's poorly clothed and they're lacking and they have need, and you go to them and you just say, well, great, thank you for sharing with me. I'll be praying for you and I hope it gets better. James is trying to tell you if that's the way you respond to somebody who's in need, if you do not respond with love, then your faith is a dead faith. It's a forgery. For there should be conviction of our heart to understand that love needs to be expressed in that kind of situation. And so James tells us, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's a forgery. That's what dead faith looks like. It sees a heart need, it sees the challenge that's before us, and it goes and walks away from it, just like Jesus shared the story of the Good Samaritan, of the many people, the religious leaders that walked down that pathway, and they saw someone lying there for dead, and instead of helping them, they either stepped over them or passed by. But it was that Good Samaritan who walked down the path and saw the person in need and got off the animal that he was traveling on and gathered him up and did what the Lord intended for his people to do, to show compassion. And so at the end of the story, Jesus said to them, if you know who is compassionate, who was it? And he was speaking to a Jewish audience and he had them say it was the Samaritan and then he challenged them and he said, go and do likewise. And James is saying the exact same thing here. If you see people in need and you step past them, if you walk by them and you do nothing to help their need, then you are not showing compassion. You're not showing faith and trust in God. And so they could say to us at Cornerstone, if there was somebody in our congregation that was in need, maybe they don't have enough money to put food on their table. And they explained that to you in the lobby, and you said, well, thank you for sharing that with me. Now go on your way, and I'll be praying for you. James would be saying to us the very same thing. There is a lack of compassion and your faith is dead instead of taking care of the needs that are right before you. 
So Jesus tells another story about how a, a father would make sure that his children had all that they needed for. He certainly wouldn't give them a snake when they needed food, if you remember that illustration. And Jesus again is telling his people what it looks like to have true faith, that we would be people that would understand that it has to have action that there is evidence of what God has done in our life, the transforming gospel that has changed my life and your life has a way of expressing itself daily in the activities that we're involved in. It expresses itself at the workplace. It expresses itself in your home. It expresses yourself in your neighborhood. It will be evident and visible for all to see because that transforming work of the Holy Spirit has made you a new creation and has now given you a new heart, a heart that will truly have compassion for people, a heart that will love to display that love for God in the way we treat one another. So James goes on to give us another, another illustration. He shows uh, false uh, salvation or false uh, faith. He then talks about the faith of demons. And he wants to challenge you and I to think differently about what faith truly is. He said, listen, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder at this very fact. What God is telling us in this story is that we can have a lot of head knowledge. We can have all the knowledge of the Bible. We could be able to recite the books of the Bible in order on a test. We might be able to recite several parts of the Westminster Confession of Faith because we have done due diligence in knowing this theology. But God is saying it's much more than knowing and knowledge because the demons even have knowledge that God is one, and they shudder, they understand, and they probably even understand God better than we do, in one sense. And James wants you to understand that your faith needs to be different than the demons, that it needs to be better than that. It needs to be understood that it's not just the acquiring of knowledge that makes you faithful and living by saving faith that it is a faith that penetrates down to the very heart of who we are and is expressed in what we do. Your head can have a lot of knowledge about God. You can be sitting here week after week, hearing sermon after sermon. You might be able to give a great outline for the book of James, but it does not matter if you don't care and love for your neighbor because your love for your neighbor is evidence that you have love for God. And Jesus, when he was asked about the summary of the law, he said this, the greatest commandment, when he was asked which one it was, it was to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And he didn't stop there. And he said, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, this is the epitome of all that I have commanded you to do. Summed up in that kind of way of a love for God and a love for people. And so often our churches have this love for God, but it's very hard to see a love for people. And it's often the charge that we have against the church is that our love for one another is not evident. The very thing that Jesus said we would be known for would be our love for each other, but because we haven't seen faith in that way, it's easy for us to see a need and pass it by, to walk away and say, I'll pray for you and actually never act. And so James is gonna say, listen, you need to be hearers and doers of God's word. We looked at that last week, and we were challenged by God's word to remember that it's much more than just hearing. It involves the doing of God's work, and so James is speaking to you and to me this morning, challenging the very way we think about our faith. If it is all about knowledge, we're just like the demons. Some may say, isn't James then saying that we're saved by our works? Now, I've just led groups of men through the book of Galatians, and we were studying how our salvation is justified not by works, but by the work of Jesus Christ, not something that we can perform. Now, James is not addressing that issue in this letter. 
James is addressing the result of your salvation, not how you're saved. That's what Paul is dealing with in the book of Romans and Galatians. You're saved not by anything that you can do on your own, and the gospel is the good news that Jesus has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so now the joy of knowing this is that there's a result of now being part of the family of God. That transformation of the gospel that's taken root in our heart has now made us new. And we now will have a love for God and a love for people because that's what God is. That's who he has been through generation after generation. He has been the one who has displayed his love for us even in the sending of his son to die for you and me, to take our place, to take my sin upon the cross and nail it there once and for all, to now accept me as a son of God and to say that now I have, I'm the sonship, now that I have, I'm an heir of all that he offers to us as God's children and he'll hold nothing back. And because of God's love for me, even when I was opposed to him, even when I was an enemy of his, the Lord came and he died for me and he's done the same for you. And because of that good gospel news, that changes the way we live. It changes everything about us. You've heard me saying that over and over again. So James is not contradicting Paul. James is speaking about something different. He wants you to understand the result of what happens because the gospel's now touched your heart. It's going to change you Dramatically, it's going to give you a new love for God and a new love for people. The reformers said it this way, we're saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. So James is trying to address that particular issue, the idea that we could have faith but have no evidence in our life and no visibility that we truly love God. So James corrects us. He uses now an illustration from Abraham. Abraham, the great great patriarch in the book of Genesis for us, he said this, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled saying Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. What was the evidence of faith in Abraham? It was taking his precious son, Isaac. And if you've read the story, you would see how hard it was for Isaac to come into existence in the first place because Abraham and Sarah concocted other schemes because they thought they could do better than God did. So they used a servant in Abraham's household to try to bring this son of promise into the world, but that was not the way God intended. And so Abraham and Sarah, who heard that they were going to be parents when they were over 100 years old, they even laughed when they God spoke this promise. And could you imagine how precious Isaac would be in the arms of Abraham and Sarah? How amazing it would be to hold on to that flesh and then to hear God say to Abraham, now Abraham, I want you to take your son Isaac and I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice. This precious little boy that meant the world to them, it was the promise of God and they would begin to wonder, what on earth are you doing, God? Isn't he going to be the son of promise? Isn't all of generations going to be fulfilled through him? And Abraham, in response, what did he do? He obeyed. (coughs) He took that child. Could you imagine walking up to the mountaintop? and even having the wood on the back of Isaac, and his son says, Dad, what's the wood for? Could you imagine how hard it would be even to speak, knowing that he would be tying his son down on this altar, and that the outcome would be his death? And this is a story that Abraham wants you to see, that Abraham's love for God even enabled him to give up the precious and most precious gift that God had ever given to Abraham. And James wants you to understand that that's what the Lord desires of you and of me. 
to give up the most precious thing that we have in this world and that we would trust and love God and it would be evident in what we surrender and in what we give up. And that's why he uses Abraham as that example. What would you do if God asked you to do the same? James wants you to understand that the willingness of Abraham is an example of saving faith, of someone who really gets it, someone who is not a forgery in this world. And you see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. He acted in faith and he put his trust in the Lord even though it was the most precious thing in his life. And so James wants you to understand that a faith that has no action, where there's nothing following up to, it is a dead faith, it's a faith that lacks any kind of evidence, but the gospel has transformed you and has made you somebody new so that you would be just like Abraham. And that's the story that he explains here. And if that's not good enough, he's gonna tell you another story, another Old Testament saint by the name of Rahab who was a prostitute. A Canaanite that was not part of the Jewish community, but because she had a faith and a trust in God, when the messengers came to her city, she took them into her home and she harbored them, knowing that she would be putting her life at risk. And she did that because she knew that she had a great love for God. And now it was displayed in this very act of taking God's people and providing for their needs. She didn't say, well, see you later. I'm glad you came into town. I'll pray for your success. She took them into her home. She fed them. And she found a way to enable them to escape so that the people that were hunting them down would not put them to death. And that, James wants you to understand is an act of saving faith, a faith that is, has action to it. And the story of Corey Ten Boom is another example of the same thing. A lady who loved God in such a way that their family had a love for the Jewish people in the middle of the Nazi German occupation. And instead of wishing and praying for the Jewish people to be able to find their way and and find a way to safety, they decided that they would tear out a part of their home and make it a secret passageway for them to hide people in the attic of their home and you can go to her hometown today and walk through the very house and see where they were able to hide. And that became the hiding place for Jewish people and it was a result of their love and they were willing to give up their comfort in living life and they saw what that meant because her whole family was arrested and taken to the concentration camp and she was the only one who survived out of her family. And she did that as an act of faith. She was showing, saving true faith, showing that her faith was in action and her love for God was expressed in her love for Jewish people. And James wants you to understand that if you have a love for God, it should be expressed in how you love our neighbor and even your enemies. And you've heard me illustrate with Corey Ten Boom and how she was able to fill that for you. And for us as an example. And James is teaching us that the transforming power of the word of God is gonna do that work in us. To have a saving faith and not a fake one, not a forgery that's hard to be able to see, but one that is on display. So Jesus said, you will be the salt and light of the world and you'll be evident to one another. Are you willing to give up the comforts of your life like Corey Ten Boom and Rahab did because you love the Lord your God that way? James wants you to think about that. He wants you to put your trust and faith in him. Are you willing to surrender the most precious thing in your life and when I was younger, you've heard my story where sports was probably the most precious thing in my life and the Lord taught me that I needed to set that aside and to follow after him and to trust him and to put my faith in him and he's asking you to do the same thing. He may call you to risk your life and the comforts that are there in your life. He might ask you to surrender what's precious in your life. He might say to you, what is your Isaac? And he offers to you his love and his compassion 
and he desires for you to display that to one another. Abraham acted out of love for God. Rahab acted out of a love for God. Corey Ten Boom acted out of a love for God and call, God calls us to love him with all that we are and to show love to those around us, our neighbors and our enemies. That is true religion. That's how you know a true portrait from a forgery. Tim Keller said this, a real Christian is somebody who says, I was homeless, I was naked, I stunk in the nostrils of God. I have been saved strictly by grace. Therefore, when you come upon somebody who actually stinks or who actually is homeless or who is actually marginal, you will see the connection and you'll see yourself in them and you'll willingly get off your animal and you'll get down on the ground and you'll roll up your sleeves and you'll display love to a world that needs that kind of love. That's the true church that God intended Cornerstone to be. That's the type of people he wants to gather in our midst so that we would see the world turned upside down like he did through the lives of the apostles in the early church. And the Lord continues to do that even now in our day. What kind of faith do you have? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, your word again challenges our heart. And James has been doing this week after week. It's like having a sledgehammer hit us on the head over and over and over again. But we are mindful that we are people that need to hear the message over and over again. The goodness of your gospel can be forgotten in our life and not even evident in our faith. So, Father, may you work in us and may the power of your Holy Spirit remind us of this life that you've called us to and the power of the gospel that is within us. For the same power that raised your son up from the grave is now upon us and in us, accomplishing your work and your kingdom's goal, that your kingdom would reign here on earth as it does in heaven. Enable us as your church to be true salt and light to a needful world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.